Ja. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And I'm so pleased to hear to be here with uh, Sim Vanderein. Uh, thanks, Sim, for joining me for this uh, dialogue. Delighted. Well, let me uh, first introduce you. Um, you know, I checked your website and uh, and I uh, brought up some material here. And it's uh, it says that you're a teacher, a writer, a researcher, and a practitioner of design for 40 years, and that you've been a leading authority on ecological, sustainable architecture and design, and that you're a professor emeritus of architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. Is that in the environmental design building? Is that where you were? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just over there a couple weeks ago on doing a design workshop. So, And then you were also a California State architect in the 70s, uh, and um, they, you, you're known for your innovative designs for homes, sustainable communities, retreat centers, schools, commercial buildings, and uh, won many awards as well as uh, the thing we really want to talk about was your book, which is um, Design for an Empathic World, and I can actually show that here. So this is, a, oh, and, and it's on the screen here too, Design for an Empathic World, uh, Reconnecting People, Nature, and Self. So if you want to show it as well, at the, if by hand, that's, you're welcome to do that. There it is. In the flesh. <laughs> Great. Um, so, yeah, uh, is there anything else by way of uh, introduction you'd like to add, Sim, about yourself, uh, your background? and? Oh, it sounds like you covered, uh, covered a lot of it. And this book, for me, was kind of a summation of 55 years of... of uh, uh, being an architect and planner and teaching and and also being involved in the you know politically uh, particularly as California state architect um, where we had a governor who was uh, basically his great gift was as he always said he was an ins he had an insider's mind but a, I, he had an insider's knowledge but an outsider's mind and uh, he brought a lot of outsiders, outliers into state government in the 70s and... Uh, so that was uh, Jerry Brown when he yeah. was uh, governor that you... Uh, the first time, yeah. Mm -hmm. The first time he was governor. So for me this was kind of a summation. Um, actually I was trying to uh, market another book, uh, this one, uh, which I just got a copy of this from London yesterday. Uh, these are collected essays over 50 years, about two, three from every decade, starting from 2000, 2010, and going back to the 60s. Um, so this also has the watercolor. Has oh, nice. Book. Well, um, so uh, that's what I was really trying to do uh, originally was uh, uh, was basically get the essays published that no American publishers are interested in. You know, they do anthologies and. Uh, so um, my uh, partner, my editor, both just kind of got me. Oh, you could write a new book. <laughs> uh, so I said, well, I don't know how much I have to say that's positive about what you know what happens in the world of architecture and planning, particularly uh, uh, as things get got more and more dysfunctional and crazy in this in our culture here. But so I went ahead and and uh, and did that. Um, and was really writing it, I think, for the younger designers, um, because the the big message for the big message, uh, which I've probably learned, you know, very late in life, is that being in touch with your inner self and knowing your inner truth. I mean, we live in this culture now, you know, social media and all this projection of self or what you think people want. <laughs> mm -hmm. How people want, how you want people to see you, but it may not really be the you that you really are. Um, so uh, that's, uh, and I do talk about the experiences. I think that for me, that shape, that shape the inner self, and I think it's a thing. I think it's an aspect that's 
you know, overlooked a great deal in our culture today. Where uh, I'm not a religious person, but I am a spiritual person, <laughs> and uh, um, I think, and for me, that's also was a big part of the empathy part because early in my life, um, I did really connect to the natural world, um, and that's never gone away. And the watercolors, actually, those were. I've never shown these watercolors until this book came out, <laughs> yeah, or before. And uh, for me, going, being in nature was always, and painting was kind of a med my meditation. Mm. It was, I also taught watercolor too, to in environment in the uh, College of Environmental Design, and would, would take students to places that I loved. And the only rule was no talking. We'd get there at ten in the morning, stop at four, and uh, there was no talking, no competition uh, in the process. So, and I think also in terms of empathy, uh, you know, everyone's got their, you know, now we got, we all got our iPhones. We can take, I don't, but we take pictures with iPhones. And there's a difference between between looking, which is an outward projection, and seeing, which is an inward. <laughs> mm -hmm. An inward process, and so I would say, uh, you know, that's one example. I think an important example of empathy when people can just sit in quiet and absorb a place. I know when I start a new project, and a lot of my projects, as I say in one of my other books, um, I like working where nature is foreground and not background, um, and. In order for me to see that foreground, I mean, I will spend a day on the site just meditating, painting, taking it all in. And I know many architects will design something without even going to a site. They'll look at a map or something, look at a contour map. Um, so, and, and quite frankly, the empathy side of it, I mean, I always had a broad, you know, uh, I had an abstract, you know, empathy for humanity, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I was, uh, but actually on one-to-one -one basis, I wasn't necessarily empathetic, and that's been a long, you know, a lesson I've learned late, late in life. Um, uh, well, let but, me reflect a little bit what I'm hearing. So yeah. what I heard is, if this book has really been like a summation of your Mm -hmm. of, of your life or your work up till now and that you've uh, been that you've valued kind of the meditative and being in nature and really that when you create a work or architect when you design something that you actually go to the place and really just try to absorb it and to uh, let it uh, you know really empathize with the environment it sounds like really take it in and mm -hmm. that, um, I'm also hearing that maybe you weren't on a relational level that you're saying that you maybe weren't the most empathic to begin with in terms of relationships? Um, um, or I think that's true. Well, it also, uh, I think that's that's true. It, it also, you know, relates to the kind of trauma of, um, of being European Jews who left uh, Holland uh, the day before the Nazis invaded it. Mm. And and uh, you know we lived a very comfortable life there, and then all of a sudden we were thrown into chaos and wound up in New York. Um, and it was something my you know I could tell my parents uh, uh, were in real pain, but there was never would be never discussed. And also you know if guests their other refugee friends would come to the house to play bridge and. If I would were at the door, as well, if I was at the door, I'd say, "Oh, how are you, Mr. Frankfurt?" And my father would say, "Don't pry into people's business." <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm not blaming it anyone, but I think that would, that uh, part of that relational empathy took a long time to develop because uh, of the kind of <laughs> um, trauma that was, you know, was just there. Uh, um, yeah, know, people like, didn't want to talk about it, and it was just let's exactly. shut it. Let's just keep it shut down and keep it private. 
and let's not dialogue about it. So the empathy is kind of shut down in that in that case, really. Yeah, exactly. And that was, you know, a kind of manners that was in the. That's bad manners to ask people personal questions um, that they might feel uncomfortable answering. And uh, um, uh, and but for you know that and that was interesting in writing this because. Uh, um, I've written about that before, but this time I think I really got it. <laughs> uh -huh. what, what the you know what the root cause, uh, the root cause was of that. Um, you mean the root cause in terms of the family just had been so traumatized they didn't want to bring it up, and and that. Oh the, yeah, no, I, or the, yeah. Or the or the root cause that you weren't really empathic is because you hadn't didn't see it modeled. Oh well, that's that's yeah, that's the that's the basic thing. If you don't, um, and talking to a lot of other people, it's, it's similar. I mean, the the family of origin has a lot to do, I think, with um, how yeah, um, whether one connects or does you know how one connects to to other people. I would say mm -hmm. it's around how one connects. I mean, as a teacher. I think I was actually quite empathic because I always, number one, you know, as I point out in the book, unfortunately architecture education is still stuck in a very old model and I would, I would call it the Ayn Rand model uh -huh. <laughs> uh, where the idea is, you know, you're a genius, you know, um, all you need to do is find a victim for your brilliant ideas. and. And there's very little collaboration in architectural education. It, it, it's, it's on the old, it's based on a 200-year-old model of the French Beaux-Arts, uh, where you know you worked in isolation, very, very hard, and then you were judged. You know, then it would be a judging, um, and the judges would all try to outdo each other in being sarcastic, you know, and being, uh, uh -huh. being kind of mean and sarcastic and tearing students apart. Um, and I never bought into that. I always believed that that architecture uh, that it's it's a it's a collaborative process, and I and that's the way I taught it and practiced it uh, as collaboration. So on that side, I think I was I could be impatient and so forth, but uh, I think I was in my model of teaching and my model of practice was I would say quite quite empathic mm -hmm. uh, because you needed integrated teams of people not just architects to begin with uh, um, and clients you know uh, the chapter in the uh, the chapter in the book on um, um, on, des on human design just brings that out in that um, uh, well, I mean, I started as a young professor in the 60s when our motto was distrust authority, so we did. And if universities said, well, we're going to build all these new dormitories and we'll make them hotels because hotels are wonderful places. And actually my first research and monograph was around uh, studying these 10-story dormitories that built in Berkeley, which mm -hmm. were kind of like hotels, except you don't live in a hotel for four years with a stranger in your room, another person in your room. Um, and so kind of, I was one of a, there were a group of us who were working on this, the whole idea of, what well, maybe it's a clumsy term, but post-occupancy evaluation, that we need to, if architecture is both an an art and a science, where's the science? I mean, science means you have a hypothesis and you test it in the real world. Mm -hmm. Well, in architecture, in architecture, that hardly ever happens. Or the test is, oh, well, when there used to be still architectural critics who wrote for newspapers, <laughs> and they're mostly gone now, uh, the test was, the, the, the architect test says, well, if we get awards and critics think the building is great, but no one ever went and talked to the people <laughs> who use it or live there. And so we kind of created this field in the 60s of post-occupancy evaluation. And there's actually still a national organization called the Environmental Design Research Association. Well, um, your, your second chapter in the book is uh, titled Human-Centered Design. And yeah. human-centered design seems to be really catching on right now with 
IDEO and the D School at Stanford, and and it's yeah. going in. It's going from business. Uh, and design into uh, social innovation. So it seems that I've just been noticing a real rise yeah. in just the last couple of years. So you were like way early in that whole uh, movement. Uh, yeah, uh, well, we kind of created it back then in the 60s. Yes, and, and what you're saying, I, I'm finding the same thing. I mean, um, uh, I spoke a few months ago at a conference uh, and um, um, the uh, uh, there was a Google guy there who's you know involved in the building side and and these companies that really value their employees uh, are really getting them involved in the design process and paying attention to what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Um, um, so I yeah I totally agree with you. I think there is a shift. There is a shift that that's that's happening. In, uh, I think particularly in 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 companies that uh, have a larger seem to have a larger investment in their employees. Uh, you know, I always thought um, you know they used to be called personnel departments, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the language shifted to human resource departments, and I thought that was kind of interesting because the personnel department meant it dealt with people. And human resources meant that dealt with people as resources, like anything you know that are expendable. I thought I thought it was interesting. To me, paying attention to the language of a lot yeah. of this is is very important. And it's interesting, like a book with this title, and of course in your 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 institute, how many people don't even know what the word means, uh, and. You know, empathy or empathetic. Uh, even you know, pretty educated people. A lot of them, <laughs> they say, "What is that?" <laughs> well, even uh, within the field, there's so much uh, disagreement about the term itself. There's, uh, you know, Dan Batson, who's been studying this for like 30 years. He laid out a, wrote a chapter in a, in a book or an article, a paper. On, on empathy, the definitions of empathy, he laid out eight different ways the word is used. So even within, even within the academic field and, and science, that there's quite a lot of different definitions around it. So it's really, I find it really impedes uh, development because people are using the word so differently, who, let alone who, who, not knowing what it means. What was his name? This is Dan. What? Uh, Dan Batson, B-A-T-S-O-N. If you search on. Uh, my side, I have an interview with him, and we actually go oh. through uh, we go through his uh, chapter kind of step by step. And, and there's also a guy in Stanford, right, uh, who's teaching around empathy in the business school. I think you know I'm, I don't have his name right in front oh, of me. That doesn't doesn't quite ring a bell. I know that the uh, they have a design school there, um, and. They're, they've done a lot around empathy. That you know, they're using their they're using their model of 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 design being you know, the first step, empathy, and then define, and then ideate, and prototype, and test. So uh, they're very explicit about bringing empathy into the process. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's good. So, and I'm like very excited when I saw that you're talking about human-centered design, you know, nature-centered design. Uh, opportunities for empathetic design because that's really what I'm seeing human centered design at, at its core is it's really an empathic dialogue it's an empathic way of being and um, so I see it as a real potential for fostering empathy in the world you know just having those tools and those processes that can really be spread more widely mm-hmm mm -hmm. yeah well, maybe that's the next step. <laughs> if uh, uh, I mean, I did it. I did, wasn't using the word then, but as I say, most of my work was really very collaborative. I mean, I th I'd, I'd say to students, look, we are all students. We're all teachers. It's not. There's not that kind of separation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, you know, that's really important. And now that so much of education, higher education, is going online, that, that to me is a little scary too, because then you know that creates another division. 
um, or you know huge classes. Uh, one of my my research assistant way back was Robert Reich. <laughs> uh huh. Oh really? Uh huh. Um, who's wonderful, and he is actually one of the most empathetic people I I've ever met in my life. He also uh, has a weekend house down the road for me here. That, um, um, and you know, I mean, he's you know lecturing to thousands at Berkeley since he's a chancellor's professor. I mean, he's he got these huge classes, and that works for him because he just is so real. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I wonder about in education. Well, and then in lower education, I mean, the, the testing and all of that, that I see California is going to be fined billions of dollars for not, for rejecting the idea that, that, <laughs> that testing is, is equivalent with, you know, your, with actually learning. <laughs> uh, well, I'm hearing that you have some disillusionment about the way things are going, maybe. Is, is well... Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, there's the big one, of course. You know, I used um, you see in the '70s, yeah, but particularly when I was, you know, running the all the states' design and construction and codes, uh, that coincided with um, both in '73 the oil embargo, and then uh, King Hubbard's who was head geologist for USGS, uh, you know, the peak oil issue where he was projecting then by the year 2000, forget it, though, you know, all the easily available oil is gone. Um, and that provided a tremendous incentive for us to start to do things. Um, and in those days, I th you know, I'd say, well, um, well, or more recently, I'd say, well, climate change is the 500-pound you know, gorilla in the room. Now, of course, we are inside the fiber, in that inside that grill. It. Mm -hmm. It's no longer something that's outside. So I don't know, you know, talk about empathy. Uh, I mean, there's, to me, the biggest one, or one of the biggest issues we face. Um, how, do we re how do we reconcile, you know, exploitive capitalism with... Uh, of of the living world, the destruction of the living world. How do you know? How do we reconcile that with the, with any idea of empathy? Mm -hmm. I think that's that's the major problem that we face. And and uh, my friends uh, Amy Lovins and Paul Hawken, uh, you know, when they wrote the book Natural Capital, uh, I thought, well, that's kind of a slippery slope. Uh, and the framing, again, the words, natural capital, the idea, I mean, it implies that everything in the living world can be monetized. Um, and I knew what they're doing. They said we have to value these things. Uh, that's within a cap within the system we have. That's what we need to do is monetize things. But my argument would be, no, you cannot monetize everything. <laughs> yeah. You cannot. How do you monetize life itself? Uh, um, well, I'm seeing empathy as uh, as the way forward. I mean, that's kind of the sense I was getting yeah, yeah. Uh, from your book. It's like you know, we, if we have a vision, the vision going forward seems to be a more empathic world, and that oh, yeah. we we have that vision and start designing exactly what you're saying, designing for an empathic world. I mean, I love the title because that's mm. that's kind of what I've been kind of coming uh, to as well. Is that can we start <coughs> Uh, using, you know, design processes, design uh, uh, systems, design principles and methods to actually think how might we uh, create an empathic world? What can we do to change the social structures? How can we change our relationships so as it changed the, the, uh, the architecture so that it supports empathic connection between people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean that's I mean that's kind of what you're saying I think I mean, I, yeah 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 it, yeah exactly I don't know at this point in my life I'm the one I'm the one who's going to carry that forward but uh, uh, I was, would certainly support <laughs> support the effort and like to be part of it.
Yeah, and how do you see that going forward? Well, one thing is, is how did you start seeing empathy in this process? Like you're saying that that uh, maybe you didn't grow up in the most empathic, you know, environment in terms of learning and empathy and the empathic dialogue, but that you valued uh, collaboration, which takes uh, empathic collaboration, that you would, uh, you know, bring that into your classroom. When did you start uh, getting, saying, hey, empathy, this is important, and this is the nature of empathy, uh, kind of more explicitly or, or even implicitly? Um... I think it was just there. Uh, I didn't know the, you know, it's just like gratitude. Uh, I didn't really understand the gravity. Uh, one of my mentors, brother David Steindl Rast, I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah, I know him. I, I used to live at Esalen. Uh, oh, Institute. you did? Oh, you, <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I used to work there. You used to work there, uh, too. Okay, well, we used, oh, to yeah. hang, we used to hang out together and chat, so I, I know it's Well, I was going to say, you know, like Brother David, I mean, I was thought I'd see in Mill Valley, i see Cafe Gratitude. I said, what kind of hippie nonsense is that, you know? Uh, I didn't understand the word. I didn't really experience the word gratitude till rather late in life. Um, and Brother David's idea is, you know, if you don't have gratitude, you can't be happy. And you look at all these super rich people, uh, you know, the 1% in this country, <laughs> they don't have any gratitude. They deserve everything they have. <laughs> and they're not, you know, the data shows they're not very happy people. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, so, no, so empathy. Uh, yeah, in my work, I, I, the word really had, frankly, the term really never came up for me until probably the, you know, the since I moved back to the country from from the city, uh, which is now eight years ago, and. And it may be that just talking to plants, which was <laughs> um, my partner, who's a master gardener, um, uh, I, I would say, and I talk about it in the book, uh, um, I have this house here that I built in the 70s, but I lived in Sausalito for many years. So I had a garden and had automatic watering system, and I moved back. We, we have started a big food garden, and my partner Francine would say, you know, you have to walk in the, you have to go in the garden every day. And... Oh. Are you still there? Looks like we had a little oh, disconnection. Okay, looks like we uh, lost the connection. Might have to, we don't get it back in a second. Might have to end this broadcast. <laughs>